The apostle, as he closes out the book of Romans, if you look at verse 19, he says, for your obedience, the obedience of the Roman believers, the church at Rome, and again, now the church at Rome here is, is true believers, a congregation, an assembly of sinners saved by grace. And he says, your obedience is come abroad unto all, all men. In other words, people were aware that there was a church that God had raised up a church, you know, the church means the called out ones. The church refers to God's elect. It refers to the redeemed of the Lord and their obedience in the gospel. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about their morality. Uh, we promote morality. And Paul promoted it here for the Roman believers. But he's not saying just that your morality has uh, come unto, uh, abroad and all men, but it's their belief in Christ. Because this was an issue that many times brought danger and peril to the people of God, especially in Rome where Caesar reigned. You see, Rome was the, the capital, the center of the Roman Empire. And Caesar ruled. And uh, many times, whoever was the Roman Caesar... Uh, 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 by the providence of God, there were many of them who just turned, turned against any, uh, any form of Christianity and went after it. Uh, we know that Nero did later on, uh, that he persecuted Christians and they, they arrested Christians. But now these were, at this point in time, they were enabled to, to exist in the city of Rome and still worship. And it was their belief of the gospel, their belief of Christ, their identification with Christ. Their message had, and their obedience in that had, had come abroad unto all men. It was well known. People were focused on what's going on in Rome. Paul wanted to go there. And he says, I'm glad, therefore, for on your behalf. And that, you know, that, this is something Paul rejoiced in. Uh, and, and, what he's, and, this, and remember the context here now. Remember, he had just told them uh, to mark them which cause divisions and offenses among them uh, uh, contrary to the doctrine. And so this is kind of like an encouragement. He urges them to be careful and to be wise in God's word in order to judge good and evil, to know the difference between what glorifies God and exalts Christ and what unites and edifies brethren and what does not. And so they, he didn't want them to be deceived. Beware. He wanted them to beware and to be wary of spiritual contamination by false preachers. And he exhorted them to judge and expose and avoid them. And their obedience in all these matters, their insistence upon staying with the truth, had uh, the knowledge of that had come abroad to all men. And Paul rejoiced. He said, I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf. He says, but yet I will have you wise unto that which is good and simple, that is harmless, uh, concerning evil. Now we talked about that, you know, those, uh, you know, we, the Lord told his disciples, you remember when he sent them out to preach the kingdom, tell people the kingdom of God was at hand. Christ had come, the Messiah had come. He told them, he said, now when you do this, he said, be wise as serpents and be harmless as doves. And so what Paul is saying here is that in your endeavors to get the gospel out, to witness the gospel, in your endeavors to stand for the truth, use some wisdom and be harmless. Now, the gospel message is a message that men and women by nature hate. It's offensive to them. And that hatred will react against the people of God in different ways and different degrees. Most of the time in our day, it's just simply people ignoring us. Or people, uh, they don't want to talk about religion with you because they, they may have heard what you believe or they may think they know what you believe. So they just, they just kind of like isolate themselves from you in a religious way. But back then and then even sometimes today, I think, uh, people react uh, uh, violently against it. And so Paul's saying, now you use some wisdom and you be harmless in this 
And be skillful in the word of righteousness. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. To witness to Christ, to tell lost people of the only way of salvation, which is by God's grace through the blood and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way. And so this is the issue. He says in verse 20, he says, And the God of peace, that's who God is, and what he's talking about, he's not talking about peace at the expense of the truth. He's not talking about peace that is brought about by compromise. But God's the God of peace, peace between God and sinners by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. What we want to tell people is that the only way that you can have peace with God is through the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of his cross. His righteousness imputed. Be, God is reconciled to his people because he made Christ to be sin for us, who knew, Christ who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the ground of peace with God, the imputed righteousness of Christ. And so we beseech sinners, be ye reconciled to God on that same ground. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this God of peace... This God who is reconciled to us through Christ and to whom we are reconciled through Christ shall bruise or shall tread upon Satan under your feet shortly. Now that's an interesting way to put it. He's going to tread upon Satan. What's Paul talking about? You know, uh, you see the word bruise there. Sometimes, and, and if you have a concordance there, uh, it probably uh, says something like tread. Uh, he'll tread upon Satan. In other words, he's going to defeat Satan. Now, you remember back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, how the promise of the gospel there, the woman's seed, that's Christ, it said that Satan will bruise his heel, but he will bruise Satan's head. That, that word means crush. And that prophecy was fulfilled fully at the cross. That's when Satan was cast out. And so, uh, uh, in time, Satan's always been under the sentence of condemnation and under defeat. Satan has never had a, a, a leg up on God, you might say. There never was a time where God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, was ever uh, in danger of being defeated by Satan. But for God's purposes, Satan has been allowed to run wild sometimes in the world, especially under the Old Testament. And then in the last days, it says that Satan, who is bound, is going to be released to deceive the nations. I believe that time has come because there's so much false religion. And that's what Satan does. Satan doesn't work in the realms of uh, of. Uh, obvious evil that's evil even that which the natural man uh, sees satan is a deceiver satan appears the bible says in second corinthians 11 as an angel of light and so many times uh, satan will be behind the pulpits of america preaching a false gospel a gospel of conditional salvation free willism work salvation and calling it Christianity, calling it grace. And that's why, that's why we have to be careful. You know, Peter said that, that put on the whole armor of God, that you uh, uh, stand against the wiles of Satan. Satan does not expose himself uh, in an obvious way. He, he's, uh, he comes in stealthily through false preachers. And so even though his defeat is imminent, he's already been defeated at the cross. Uh, he's been loosed to deceive the nations, and so it's a continual battle. The, uh, if you look over in Rome and Revelation, chapter 12, there's a, a, a good description of this issue. It talks about the great dragon, beginning at verse 9, Revelation 12 and verse 9, and listen to what it says. It says, the great dragon was cast out, he was cast, you remember Christ said that he was cast out at the cross. The prince of this world is cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Now that's the world in general. That's the unbelieving world. 
That's not everybody without exception. He doesn't deceive God's children. Even you know, He may for a time. But at some point in time, God's children are going to be called into the kingdom and enlightened by the revealed word. They're going to know God. They're going to know Christ. They're going to know themselves. They're going to know the way of salvation. And they won't be deceived by Satan. But Satan will still attack. And he'll attack from without. He'll attack within. He'll bring in confusion, error, division, all of that. And he says, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, and he does it by false religion. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. In verse 10 he says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation. That's Christ. And strength, the power. Who is Christ? He's the wisdom and the power of God. And the kingdom of our God. And how do I know that's Christ? That's the power of his Christ. And the, the accuser of our brethren. And that's saying he accuses. Now what does he accuse us of? Well, we're sinners. I'm a sinner. And I deserve nothing but death and hell. And he accuses them uh, before our God day and night, verse 10. But look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. How do you overcome Satan when he accuses you of being a sinner? You are a sinner. I am a sinner. But we plead the blood. We plead the righteousness of Christ. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who can condemn us? It's Christ that died. Risen again and seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. And so Satan, the accuser, he'll attack the church, but he won't win. And what Paul back here in Revelation 16, turn back to it. I mean, Romans 16. He says, Say, uh, the God of peace shall tread upon Satan under your feet shortly. Now, that means Satan is shortly going to be defeated. How shortly? Paul didn't know. None of us know. But it, Satan's final defeat Verse 20, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's our only hope. That's our home, uh, the, the three greatest enemies of the, of the people of God. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And our only hope of, of uh, victory in that battle is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us. Amen. It's not going to be by our goodness and our works and our power and our own personal wisdom. It's all by the goodness, the works, the power, the wisdom of God, the grace of God. Now Paul begins to mention some names here. He mentions Timotheus, my work fellow. That's Timothy. Books of Timothy, we're familiar with them. Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my kinsmen salute you. And then... In verse 22, this causes some, uh, uh, what we call Bible scholars, some problem, but it shouldn't. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Now, who wrote this? Paul or Tertius? Well, I'm going to tell you who wrote it. The Lord did. <laughs> this is the word of God. And he wrote it through the apostle, uh, he revealed it through the apostle Paul. And Tertius was like Paul's secretary who recorded it while Paul dictated. Now that's what I, I'm sure this is the way it was. You see another instance of that in the Old Testament in the prophet Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah received the word of God and he dictated it to a man named Baruch. And he wrote down, you see in the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations. So Tertius is writing his own little personal note here as the recorder of the words of God through Paul. And he says, I salute you in the Lord. And then he mentions verse 23, Gaius, mine host. So Paul was staying at the home of a man named Gaius. And, uh, uh, and this, this is in Corinth, you know, that's where Paul was when he wrote this letter. And of the whole church, every member of the church saluteth you, he mentions a man named Erastus, who was the chamberlain of the city. That means he was the treasurer of the city of Corinth, and that must have been some job. Corinth was a major, major commercial port. And this man, uh, Erastus, 
was a, was a man of authority, uh, a man who was known and respected, but he was a believer. And so that, that means that, uh, uh, that shows us you don't have to, to give up the positions that the Lord has given you unless that particular position causes you, in order to, to attain it or to maintain it, you're caught, you're, uh, uh, to, you have to compromise the gospel. And you don't do that. So he says, Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluted you, and Cortus, a brother. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Again, we know that there is no hope for any of us in any uh, time, whatever hard times we're going through. We know we look, we, we've been spoiled in our day. I know my generation has. And we're just not used to this kind of thing, you know, this, this kind of... Uh, uh, quarantine and all of this. And our tendency is to complain. And, and of course, you know, in, uh, when we put things in perspective, uh, we know that our complaining is ultimate, ultimately against the Lord. We ought to be ashamed, and I, I know we, we should be and are. But we know that in whatever age we live, whether it's a golden age or whether it's an age of trouble, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that's going to get us through. We know that whatever trial or trouble we're going through, it is no indication that, that uh, God is bringing his wrath down upon us because we're not under the wrath of God. The wrath of God is totally uh, gone for God's people. Because Christ took that wrath upon himself. When our sins, as our sins were imputed to him and he went under the wrath of God at the cross. So, we're, so though we may be inconvenienced, we may be troubled, we may be sick unto death. It's no indication of the wrath of God for the people of God. Now Paul closes in these last three verses, he closes uh, the book of Romans with a doxology. You know, we sing the doxology. Well, what is a doxology? It's an ascription of praise to God. It's an expression of praise to God. And listen to how he closes out the book of Romans. He says, now to him that is a power to establish you, to ensconce you in the safety. And when he talks about power, he says, power to establish you according to my gospel. This is, this, is, this is establishment in the power of God unto salvation wherein the righteousness of God is revealed. And he says, and the preaching of Jesus Christ. See, this is the whole thing. Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us that Christ is both the power of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. And the preaching of the gospel is the power of God to those who believe. That Christ is my wisdom. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my uh, sanctification, set, setting me apart. Christ is my redemption. On the cross, he redeemed me from my sins. When he comes again, he'll redeem me from this world, so to speak. He already bought and paid for his people. And so it's all according to my gospel, Paul says. He calls it my gospel not because it originated with him, not because this is exclusively Paul's message. When I was in seminary, where, by the way, I was lost and there was no gospel there, they would talk about Paul and John and Peter uh, as if they had three different messages. And so it's, it's kind of like, uh, saying, well, if you're going to follow Paul, you're going to follow Peter, you're going to follow... No, they had the same message. And it was the same gospel. It was the preaching of Jesus Christ, the glorious person, and the finished work of Christ. And Paul says here in verse 25, according to the revelation of the mystery. And what is that mystery? The mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Well, he's talking about the mystery uh, of the gospel. Uh, the revelation 
that is of God, which is uncovered of the whole gospel, which men by carnal reasoning and understanding could not know. Over in 1 Corinthians 10, he said this thing, uh, this mystery. Now remember, a mystery in the Bible is not something you get clues and try to figure out. A mystery in the Bible is something that has to be revealed by God. You're not going to know it unless God reveals it. And in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul wrote that this, this mystery, this salvation, this uh, 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 gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, wherein the righteousness of God is revealed. What is the righteousness of God? It's the merit of the obedience unto death of the Lord Jesus Christ, which God has imputed to his people, charged to his people. That mystery has never even entered the minds of the greatest thinkers of this world, religious or otherwise. And so it's the, according to the revelation of the mystery. Now God reveals it not mystically. It's not mystically revealed. It's not a mysticism that can't be explained or cannot be stated or declared. He reveals it through his word. And so we know these things are so because this is the word which teaches us that. This is our authority. And he says, which was kept secret since the world began. Now it's been revealed to Various ones down through time. But it's been kept secret since the world began. God revealed it to Adam and Eve. He revealed it to Abel. He revealed it to Enoch. But it's been kept secret from the world since the world began. They who are of the world, they don't know it. And that's why when he reveals it to us, he's calling us out of the world and into the kingdom of his dear son. And he says it in verse 26. Now look at this. But now is made manifest, made known. And by the scriptures, the written word of God, of the prophets, that's the Old Testament that Paul's referring to. He, you see, the, the New Testament at this time is in the process of being written. But the prophets spoke of these things. This same gospel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, go on and on according to the commandment of the everlasting God and made known to all nations, not just to the Jews and not to everybody without exception. Think about it. He says made known to all nations or made known in all nations. You know, uh, he said it's been kept uh, from the world, but now it's made known to all nations. In other words, Jew and Gentile. God has a people out of every tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation which he chose before the foundation of the world, whom he justified by his grace through the blood, the righteousness of Christ imputed, whom Christ redeemed on that cross and who will be brought under the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ, his glorious person, his finished work, and they will by the power of the Holy Spirit be born again and brought to faith in Christ and repentance. That's what he's talking about. God's elect, not only among the Jews, but among the Gentiles. And that was so significant in that day is because many of the unbelieving Jews, even some who claimed to be Christian, were trying to put a fence around the gospel and make it a Jewish issue rather than an issue of God's grace for saving sinners. And then he closes in verse 27, To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Everything in salvation, everything in the salvation of sinners, everything in the preservation of God's people, and obviously everything in the final glorification in and by Christ is to be attributed to the infinite wisdom of God and is to be aimed towards the glory of God in the person and finished work of Christ. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6, he said all of this, the whole purpose of God, it is all to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. All right, may the Lord bless his word to our hearts.